Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach. <laughs> that is Dana. We yep. welcome back to the studio, Adina Menzel. Woo! Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely incredible. Thank you. So are you. Your energy is so grounded and real and normal and uh, just uh, how do you? I'm a great actress. Is it, so <laughs> is that true or are you a great person? Oh, you're sweet. Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on good days, both. On bad days, both. Um, on bad days, I like to talk like that. Um, no, I'd like to think I'm a good person. So I guess we all, all good people do some shady things sometimes. But I think I'm pretty good, pretty kind, generous person. Um, I also think um, I'm a decent actress. Certain <laughs> days with a good director. <laughs> um, and on day, and I am good at faking it till I make it. I will definitely say that. Is that a vital ingredient to what it takes to become, maybe not a star, but to live out your passion that may be seen by most as unconventional? Faking until you make it, I think we all we all need to do that. I mean, it sounds silly, but I think it's more about, um, you know how I took this yoga class once and you know, we're sitting there in this pose, you know, 45 seconds go by. And she said, if you just turn your lips, the sides of your lips up into a smile, it makes it easier. And it was so true. It's like I could sit there another 60 seconds. So I think there's something that sends those wave waves to your brain, you know. And so I think there's something about faking it a little bit that kind of puts you in a different in a different place. Totally, like a di different headspace, different mentality, different perspective and outlook. Like you mm -hmm. become, but feel something different. And that, you know, hearing that in a yoga class, do you apply <laughs> that to your every day? Because I can make the case, even you're here promoting an album, mm -hmm. an album you probably like really don't need to make. You know, you have other things going on, you mm -hmm. killing it, but you still choose to get out there and take on new projects, no matter the stress that may come along with it. Including well, like, promo days. Today, I feel really good. I woke up happy. I feel good. My son is cared for. I know where he is. My husband and I uh, had good quality time. I mean, I didn't mean that like sexy, sexy time, but you know. <laughs> I mean, you could have, but that's okay. But, but, but eh, it wasn't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean. But um, <laughs> my son was around and maybe last week he was at his dad's more. So then I felt a little bit more relaxed. And then I don't know why I'm getting into that whole situation with you. But um, <laughs> but the truth is, uh, what was I going with that? Oh, it's because I had a really nice morning. But if it had been a really shitty morning, I would have put on these crazy heels and this cute outfit and had my makeup done and 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 gotten into some kind of headspace and um and would have probably climbed my way out of it and then sat here and been just joy, joy for you. Is there a way to control or at least manage those variables so you can ensure that you can wake up in a better headspace every day? Have you figured any of those variables have out? Have my son stayed his dad so I can have quality time with my <laughs> husband? <laughs> Uh, no, no. Um, what can I ensure to have all of those variables? Yeah, like, is that the question? Is there like a connection or a through line to all those mornings that start positive? And how do you duplicate that or ensure that it's happening as, mm. as often as possible? I wish there was a through line. It's definitely, it's probably good if I just don't forget my head meds. That's important. You know, yeah. those days where you forget them. And you say, why do I feel so shitty? And then you realize, you oh, it. because I... Um, By the way, very <laughs> common problem for me and uh, tens well, of millions also of Well, also when you travel, I mean, my publicist is here, but I'm, I think she knows I'm very comfortable talking about that stuff. And I find it really hard when I travel and I'm in different um, time zones yeah. and the plane and just changing my, you know, therapist always says, well, just put it next to your, your toothpaste or put it next to it somewhere you always go. And I'm like, well... Not always. I'm in a hotel and I unpack at this time of night and then I put my stuff in this apartment or whatever yeah. and then I forget. So anyway, just sorry. That's the. No, it's hard to keep track. It's hard to keep track. So I keep avoiding the kind of question that you're asking. But um, I think the variables change and I think I just have to just I'm just trying to go with it. And, and um, I'm not answering the question very well. There you are. Yeah. Why do you need to do music? Like, why do you need to do this album genuinely? Oh, I needed to do music that made me happy. I needed to do music that I felt people um, didn't have to behave when they listened to it. Although theater audiences aren't always the most behaved, but I wanted to do it for audiences that could misbehave. Um, I wanted to do music that I wasn't 
strategizing or overthinking what people would expect from me or what were the formulas or the rules that I was supposed to abide by being, um, having been a part of certain things that I've, like, I'm not supposed to talk about today because of the yeah. strike, but you know, just certain projects, um, um, that I think are hindering to some of the stylistic choices I've wanted to make just to move into a more, um, crossover into a more pop dance world um so um yeah i needed to make it for a lot of reasons but i did it for the right reasons which is why i've been having so much fun with it and yeah does broadway help or hurt this transition into the pop space because i can make the case that you are an icon to queer people all over the world and because queer people have taste <laughs> pop music tends to start with us mm -hmm. so it emanates from the community does Rent, Wicked, do those projects yeah, help her? I would think that's such a, what, let's ask the manager and the publicist why it's so hard to get on Spotify and see my name and not see only, um, and no disrespect to them, but like, you know, um, Elaine Stritch, if you listen yeah. to Adina Menzel, you're listening to, uh, you should listen, you know, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> I mean, how come the, uh, the algorithm does not move into, I think it should give me more Kylie Minogue. It, it, it is now. And because now Rogers wrote on this album produced with me, it's, it's moving, but yeah, I love that you say that because that's kind of why I've been loving this album for one of the greatest reasons I'm loving this album is because I've been able to connect with the queer community. I've been literally able to, um, it, the release of the album has coincided with pride. So I've been able to play all these pride events everywhere. Um, Iconic, by just the way. Uh, incredible audiences, in, in, electric energy, perfect opportunity for me to stand up there in front of all these people of a wide demographic who have been with me from the beginning of my career, who I just wanted to honestly be able to say, thank you, you know, for helping me, inspiring me, um, with how to play these roles, infusing these roles with the, their stories, um, that they've sort of, um, shared with me, my desire to live up to sort of their expectation of, you know, living their lives authentically and courageously and not compromising and all of that stuff. So, um, I have all these friends and family in the queer community that I just think, and, and everyone I don't actually know personally that I feel have really contributed to who I am and why I'm here today and, um, and also have great taste. And hopefully, um, you know, through osmosis, uh, it's, it's getting out there in a very um, organic way and, and people will find it that aren't just um, theater lovers. By the way, I can make the case that the same way the fans have been there for you. These roles have been there for them mm -hmm. to give them Aww. better understanding of themselves, to teach valuable lessons, to instill things that, at least speaking for me personally, have shaped me into the person I am today and continue to shape me. Like pillar, pillar stuff. I think they're for everyone. I mean, uh, I mean, I just can speak from for myself, but um, it's, uh, we all, I think it's scary to, really step into our own power sometimes especially when we're really aware we feel deep down in our gut that it's it's uh it's powerful and um when you know it deep down and you're and you hold it back because you're afraid of alienating people or upsetting the norm or whatever it is or just um um attracting you know more scrutiny and and criticism and all that stuff there's so much there's so much that um i just think that we all can relate to that you know what do you learn about yourself from making this album um that i'm still a shitty dancer but that really hot sexy <laughs> dancers around you can make you look good <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say you're a shitty dancer? Because I've never been a good dancer. People always call me a triple threat. That's such a lie. A triple threat, for anyone that's listening, is like an, in Broadway terms, it's, you know, you sing, you act, and you dance. I'm not a triple threat. If I'm dancing in something, they put me in the remedial room next door, the small, <laughs> the small B room, and they put the assistant choreographer with me for like eight hours of tuto tutorial. And because my brain cannot handle learning eight counts of... I, I just, I can't, but I moved, you know, but when you have a choreographer that kind of gets how you move mm -hmm. and doesn't try to force stuff on you and kind of takes it 
for me, which I did with, with Richie, I, um, uh, then it, then it seems really, you know, um, natural. And so I just had so much fun with that. What else have I learned about myself? Uh, <sighs> <laughs> You know why I'm doing this side because I've been doing so many interviews lately and I'm just going to be hundred percent honest. Um, you have been everywhere. I've, I'm, you know, I start to hear my own, um, narrative because you do so many interviews and you start to, you try not to repeat yourself cause you want an interview to feel, um, specific to where I am. So, cause I, I, I never phone anything in. I'm a creature of eight shows a week. I like to find new things in each show and that's what I love about it. Um, is that really what kept you going? Like making each show from day to day different than the last? Yeah, I, I like doing that. That's, I find that interesting. I find that um, I think it keeps you in the moment and present, whether it's with your partner, like your, your, your scene partner, whether it's with the band that's, that's behind you, whether it's with the audience member in the front row that you discovered for the first time that day, whether it's, whether it's with, um, you know, something that happened with my family or something I'm working out in my own life and that, that connection to the music, the song or the scene and how it informs that, uh, the meaning of it that particular day. I mean, all those things are really great um, discoveries that you make as an artist. So I like it. Those things don't get monotonous to me. The hardest thing about each shows a week is just getting there, getting your body up Physically. and all the prep stuff. Yeah. But what I was going to say to you before was that I, I was just doing, um, an interview and I, I just it started to hit me like god you say the same thing over and over Adina you talk about you know you, I'm very self-deprecating and I'm aware that people um connect to me because they think that I can be that I'm real and that I and I'm not afraid to you know show my vulnerabilities and that's all 100% true um but it also is like this insecurity thing is so exhausting. And so I just, and, this, and a friend of mine said, you know, you get to an age where you feel like you keep telling the same story because you're used to that story. And then there's a time where it's like, that's not my story anymore. I'd like a new story. So um, what I like about this album though, is it it's pretty, it's introspective, but it's pretty much like I'm, I'm ready. I deserve the spotlight. And it's not just because I'm a performer spotlight. It's for anyone out there. I mean, we all deserve our own stage, our own spotlight. Um, we deserve to be seen and to be heard, but there's definitely an active, um, aspect to the album that I need to, you know, that I have when I'm on stage. Um, and I just need to incorporate it more in my, in my daily life. I, th I guess I feel like I need to kind of knock myself in order to seem, um, more appealing or more what, like, mm, why can't a it. woman just speak, um, confidently and assertively about myself and, and still be appealing to people, you know? But the truth is, are you still appealing or has society ingrained in us that you wouldn't be appealing so you don't even do it? So like I, I roll it, I dial it back a little bit. I think I do that. Um, but what your question was what? So I don't like, say? Is, are you not being assertive and being exactly what you want to be because people won't receive it well? But we really don't know people won't receive it well. We just know that that's what society tells us they're going to feel. Yeah. When the reality is like that could be a whole side that they've been clamoring for and looking for and could be inspired by. So true. I, I, I think right now I compartmentalize it and I say they're okay with it being on a stage and me knocking their socks off <laughs> with my big voice on stage and I can be funny and bold and, um, but it's more like in my daily life, but I, I can't tell a chicken or the egg. That's why I'm saying I'm doing a lot of introspection mm -hmm. because, um, is it me doing that? Is it me that's so exhausted by myself, <laughs> um, that I, when I'm off stage, I like to be quiet and I like to be introspective and I, I am more introverted, you know? So is that the case or I, it probably should be somewhere in the middle and nothing's extreme and black and white. Yeah. You know? I do very much relate to wanting a new story to tell. Because repeating the same shit to people. Shtick. It's a yeah, shtick. It's a, yeah. You know, I, I, I could tell people without even thinking about it at this point, how I started in radio, because it's something I get asked every day, every mm -hmm. other day at a minimum. But like, it, there's a point where you're like, I need a new fucking story. I need to rewrite something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of what was and what is, but like, what, what will be, you know? Exactly. 
And I feel like this album is a part of what will be. And also maybe your perspective on what it was is changing as you're getting older and more successful and wiser. And so, yeah, the way you see it through the lens that you're seeing it is changing. And I just feel like before I even can think of that, I've already jumped into my shtick. Yes. You know, because you're on autopilot. Because yeah. That's what they want. Yeah. So now, now ask me a question and I've answered 1,200 times. <laughs> well, let me ask I'm kidding. I'm going to give you a really good new answer but just you, for you. But what's interesting is you wouldn't you wouldn't give an autopilot response to a role you're playing, but you give an autopilot response to the role that is you. Yeah. No, I don't give autopilot. It's just, well, it's not autopilot. It's just, it's, I need to think about who I am at this point. I keep go. I keep thinking, I don't know what I'm saying. No. <laughs> Well, when you do interviews, you know people are going to ask you about like the three or four biggest roles you've done every time. Do you wish people would stop asking that, or do no. you, you? Okay. So I don't want to say that at all, and I also don't want it to seem like like I'm not authentic that I just jump into something. It's just um, I tend to do the glass half empty thing. I guess is what it is. Mm. Instead of seeing it the other way, but self deprecation. But to, to be asked about to be sitting here in the first place, to be invited here, to be talking about myself <laughs> and my career and my accomplishments. Um, I for someone that actually has had a lot of highs and lows in her career and had things really exciting and then had them go away. I know how to really appreciate um even just being asked to, to to be here because you can certainly it could go away and all of a sudden you forget who i am yeah, or but I'm that's not, insecurity you know, it, well but i but it keeps you um it, it keeps you grateful and it keeps me appreciate enjoying what i'm doing yeah, so i'm that. here and i'm enjoying it and so um and i like talking about the things that i've i've done it makes actually uh, i was just telling um my friends that um, on release uh, night of the album at Three Dollar Bill out in Brooklyn, we did a release party, and um, it was supposed to be I was going to do a whole show, and it, it didn't, it wasn't going to work out to do that. So instead, it was all these incredible drag queens performed a bunch of songs from my new album, which I was so appreciative because they had to learn songs that they weren't that familiar with, you know, memorize all the lyrics so they could get a good lip sync. They did that, and they did some of the you know songs you would expect, um, and they didn't just phone it in; they had really Real production value. <laughs> it was incredible, and it was so moving to me to see, you know, them dressed as me in different roles and and performing the songs. And it just, I was able to look at it as my career and how powerful the songs are and how they make people feel. And I, I had a moment of pat myself on the back, like this is really cool, and um, and take it in. So I like talking about those things. I like singing all those songs over and over again because um, they, you know, they keep you from from. Uh, taking things for granted. But you make it different every time, you know? Yeah. I love your live albums. They're really great. Oh, thanks. And they're all different. Different Thank takes, you. different mashups of songs. You just, you, Thank you. You do a great job. Thank you. But this album, you're telling a real story. Correct me if I'm wrong here. And I feel like it's the story of you being a not drama queen, but am I wrong there? Like, it's called drama queen, mm -hmm. but the reality is you're not a drama queen. Well, I think I'm reclaiming the word. So You're redefining it's it. It's kind of like, um, kind of like diva gets a bad rap, right? I mean, um, I think that I love being a drama queen. What's a drama queen mean? It means I feel things really intensely and boldly, and a wide spectrum of. I'm dynamic, you know. I'm, I am. I'm fiery and um, passionate and romantic, and I'm also very sensitive and, um, you know, vulnerable and all these things. And I think that that's what makes us interesting human beings. You know, I can't help. It's automatic. You fall in love with me. I'm so dramatic. Like, if you're in, I mean, you knew what you were getting. Come on. What? <laughs> Don't blame me. So, w to be dramatic, it's an empowering phrase, no? Because to be forward with your emotions takes vulnerability, and that takes some fearlessness there. I think so. Um, and I also... I love, there's a lot of double entendres and things like that. I, I love that I am known for being from the theater, that I did this album with a kind of like, I don't care what people say, I'm going to do music I love. I'm still going to sing big and theatrically, quote unquote, or dramatically. But that kind of singing has always been totally great and successful over big disco Um anthems and grooves and people just don't think that way if you take a broadway person from there but barbara did it and and share and and um and and obviously donna summer and gloria gainer they're these incredible 
amazing vocalist that's staying over these grooves, you know. So it's not the weirdest thing, and it's not such a departure. So, um, yeah, that's just... It's not a departure at all, and there's a precedent for it, what you're saying. But also, like, we're in the... I think we're very much in an era of... We want bops no matter where they're coming from, but we also want genuine organic bops that have an origin story that is meaningful. Um, but it, and I know that kind of clashes a little bit, but meaning like any song has the opportunity to rise right now and take on a life. But when you know where that song comes from and you know that's coming from royalty, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, but you are royalty, Aww, it thanks. hits different. It really does hit different. And working with Nile Rodgers, like what the... Yeah. What is it like working on Paradise? And is that something that you're working on with him in the studio? Or are you corresponding online? What is what Well, is that? The, uh, it was quarantine early on. I started thinking about what kind of music, you know, um, I wanted to do next. Um, I actually called him. I knew him from a couple of different gigs that we had done together. And I, I literally asked him, what do you think? Because I need your street cred and I need <laughs> to make sure, you know, are you on board with this? Because you're was the your man. Pitch? It was, I think I want to do this and I, this is why. And I did the same thing I just told you. I think all these amazing female singers that I love have done great dance music. And, um, but I would want your blessing on it. Would you work with me on it? And um, he was, you know, starts going to his whole stories about Diana Ross and David Bowie and all these different people that, you know, he took from different genres and kind of, you know, helped them make these um, these sort of transitions and, and it, for him, it was all about just be having great music, great songs, and also really celebrating and owning the fact that I'm a great singer and not to dial it back because today's music is a little bit more linear. And I'm not saying that in a, in a bad way. Sure. It's, it's, there's less chord progressions. It's more just rides over the same thing, like verse, chorus. There's not really bridges. It kind of rides over the same chords. And so for a singer, singer, you, you need, you know, um, uh, more places to kind of go so you can use your voice and its range and express yourself. And so he was definitely an advocate of that. Like there used to be uh, modulations all the time um, in, in, I mean, we used to make fun of like, this is a Barry Manilow modulation, but um, the, the Beyonce song love on top is like the rarest thing mm -hmm. that she has like eight of them. And it's kind of a, a thing she was doing. But other than that, if you had modulations in the last 20 years, a, pot, a pro producer song where like, we can't do that. It's so cheesy. <laughs> um, so I love that we actually have two songs that have modulations because back then it was all, you can, you know, take the song down just to the piano, get rid of the four on the floor, disco beat and they can be these big beautiful ballads too which just is really um, it's a sign of a great song sign of a great song yeah and a great story yeah so i i was in quarantine and um i had some ideas that i put on my little voice memo app um that i sing i wasn't in the car because quarantine so i was home um i also wrote it with my friend jonas myron who was nearby and and niall was on in connecticut and um we put it on this little thing and then we sent it to Niall and then Niall did this whole track around it. And, and, um, and then the demo we had that was living with us for a minute cause nobody could see each other and, uh, was this very chintzy sounding little voice memo of me singing in like my bathroom to this great, amazing, um, uh, Niall track. Um, and we were going to keep it like that for a while, but then I, then when things slowed down or we started to understand we could travel and work together a little bit more with COVID, then I, I went and I hung out at his house in Connecticut and Sick. I actually sang it, yeah. That's special. Yeah. Like it's special to record something on your own, but to be there in the room and like cut it live and... Yeah. Yeah, nothing hits like that. It was great. Beast. Yes. Are you the beast? I can be. I told you I'm a drama queen. I can be a beast. <laughs> <laughs> I can be the prey. I can be the, the... What is it? The prey or the... What's the word I'm thinking of? You're not prey. You're the predator. predator. I can be the predator. I can be the prey. Um, yeah. I mean, that's just the, I think the rage, you know, that we all have that um, we're allowed to have and uh, we just have to let it, let it loose. Where are you, where do you have to be at in life to come up with a record like this? <laughs> well, there's a little um, humor to it. There's a little, uh, you know, um, self-awareness. So it's not like I'm not Alanis Morissette. I'm not like in the heat of it. I've been away from it for a while that I could look at it and, and 
a sort of step back into that character for yeah. myself. And sometimes that happens when there's, um, when like Sir Nolan produced it and wrote it with us and, um, he had this great sound, this, this track coming together and it just made, made me feel like this. Um, and so I don't know, that's how things come to me sometimes, just the way the music makes me feel. Other times I come up with the first, other times it's in the room with the incredible collaborators I have with me. They're usually, I think more talented than me. So I surround myself with them and, uh, self-deprecating again. I know, but I, <laughs> but I also think it's a compliment to myself to know when you put yourself around great people. Oh, yeah. I think that's a skill as well. The smartest people know what they don't know. Exactly. So. Yes. What a record like Beast? Are you hearing production only? Are you hearing a production with some sort of lyrics in there? How rough is it? That one we did straight from scratch in the studio. Oh, sick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we were just sitting on the couch going. I'm really good at whoring myself out for a great song. So I'm really <laughs> good at saying because I hear that a lot of songwriters they have an artist come in and they have to tug and pull huh. on them to get to that. I'm like, what do you want to know? <laughs> what would make the greatest song? You want to hear about my my ex husband? You want to hear about what happened to me when I was five years old? What can I tell you? Let's just exploit it. <laughs> I think that's like a generational difference, right? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, a little bit because. The truth is, like, a lot of artists pick the same people to work with over and over again because they don't like having to be vulnerable and share yes. with a bunch of different people. Yeah, but I was trying to, you know, um, challenge myself and put myself in rooms with people that were going to do this kind of music with me and do Healthy. it do it great and give me this integrity w with it. And so, yeah, and you don't have that much time. And so, <laughs> come on, Adina, just, <laughs> just, just trust, you know. <laughs> Look me in the eyes and I'll tell you everything. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it works. I do it. I don't know. It's the, that maybe, yeah, I don't know. I do it. it. Again, it's working. And by the way, the album is waiting for you. You should listen to all of Adina's music. It's all on Amazon Music. Just chilling there. Uh, my Love for Life. Mm, that's with Justin you, Tranter, who's my friend. What, a, what an yeah. icon, too. Yeah. What is it like working with him? Oh, he's a special human being. He's just like a cherub. Just an angel of a person. I don't know. I don't know how he how he is. I don't know how he is himself. Um, he's a special human being. He's just full of love, but also really um, knows what he wants. He's not a pushover, but he's just a huge ball of love too. And he, he hears a hook, man. And he also empowers the people around him to be better. And um, I don't know. Just he's. Um, He's a close friend. That's special energy to be around. Yeah. It's like people like that that actually teach you something new and push you to be better. And push you. Become better. Yes. Yeah. Same with um, Jake Shears, another cherub, uh, cherubic person I found in on this album. Yeah, just like, um, I don't know, there's something about them. You just feel really good in their presence. They make you feel seen. They're, they're just super generous good-hearted people i don't think they have like a bad bone in their body and not to say they don't have a bad day but they just have a way of looking at life um that stays positive and um and and i was just, what you asked me it just made me think of jake in the studio we we were in a, this was for the two songs called um dramatic and um a funny kind of lonely we wrote them we were in london i'd been dying to work with him for years and it worked out that we got together. We only had one day. Uh, we had two days we could do in the studio, but Jim Elliott, who we added to it, the mix, uh, was this great um, songwriter, producer. He was only available for one day. We all got in the studio together in um, London. I forget what studio was it. But, um, and we fell in love with each other. We start writing this great song that we loved. And then Jim says he has to get back to Wales. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it with an accent. Cause I can't. And then um, he has to get back to his wife and his two little girls. And he wished he could stay another night. And then Jake completely inappropriately goes, oh, well, we'll just come back with you to Wales. And I said, you're inviting us over to the guy's house. And um, and we do. He Jim took the train for whatever reason, and Jake and I got a car, a driver, to take the two of us. And so we finished working on lyrics for Dramatic, and then when we got to Jim's house, we ate dinner there and <laughs> got down in his studio in his basement, and we wrote this other song I love so much, Funny Kind of Lonely. And But Jake kept singing things that he'd sing the ideas we had in his range. And then when it came time to record my vocal, I'm like, okay, so let's put it in 
my range now. And he's like, oh, you can sing. Because if you sing a gut, he's got a high voice. If you sing a man's melody in the man's key, it makes the woman sing. You're just in these crazy, weird places. And uh, I said, we need to take that down. He's like, no, we don't. So it's just the highest <laughs> song for me now, especially live. It's just like, what? And he said, you can do it. And he was right. He pushed me. And I sound awesome. And I'm singing in a place I don't, not that I don't, people aren't used to hearing me sing high, but it's it's a different vibe where I'm singing. Are there any similarities between the collaborators that you're working with in the studio to bring records like this to life and collaborators that you work with on stage or on screen? Is there a difference? Any, any similarities? Oh, similarities, of course. Everybody, well, yeah, they're, they're just uh, creative people. And that means that we're all um, really brave and also really terrified all at the same time. Um, and they're diverse and they're loving and they're supportive of one another. And um, what is the, the need to push your, your partner or whoever you're working with to be their best? Does that ring true, like working on a TV set or working on like? I think so. It depends on whose role it is to push you. But um I think that's in the, in the best scenarios. You're surrounded with people that are all bouncing ideas off of you or um, lifting you up when you need it. Or, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, that's... And the older I'm getting, the more I just only want to be in those kind of rooms with people that, you know, I can trust and there's no bullshit. And, um, you know, people can be tough but not mean, you know, things like that. And by the way, like... Tough is much different than mean. Yeah. I respect tough. Yeah. I feel that way about my son's basketball coaches. I don't, <laughs> there's a difference between these guys that can be so mean to a bunch of little kids, you know, and then the kind of coach that's tough that yells at them, but they, they like it. You could tell he likes it because he feels mm -hmm. cool. And, and it's like, rooted in support. Gonna, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a tough love, but a, yeah, it's supportive. So, um, I've just found that that's been repeating itself in my life as I see that. Um, I digress. What do you do? You get that from Adam Sandler? I love Adam Sandler so much. Um, and yes, he's a a sweetheart. He also knows what he wants. He also can be tough. He but he's the most generous person um, in the world to every single person on the set, no matter what they do. Um, and you can tell. I mean, he's been with the same people forever. Did you get the same sort of supportive energy from Kristen instantly? Kristen Chenoweth? Oh, how did you just go from wanna, Adam Sandler to Kristen well, Chenoweth? I wanna, I, I mean, you're, you're doing the same role with somebody for eight shows a week. Oh, I get you. And, okay, and I thought I wasn't sure if you were saying Kristen Bell at first. Okay, I have, oh, no. I have several different five foot three <laughs> <laughs> girls with blonde hair in my life that sing and that play sisterly roles. Um, um, Yes, and all of them I love very much. And uh, so what was the question? Oh, with Kristen right away? Yeah. Well, that's because, I mean, whew, well, Wicked took so many years to develop. So when you're doing a new musical, um, you don't know what's going to happen. And you go through many workshops, and some of them are really good, and other ones sort of fall apart, take five steps forward, three steps back, you know, they make changes and certain things improve and then other things kind of get worse for a minute and then they come back around. And so that's the kind of um, project where we had to stick together and really support one another. Yeah, because that's emotionally turbulent. Because yeah. things are changing constantly. One second it could be here, the next second go. Away. I mean, that's hard. Yeah, but it's innate in the in the show, uh, the, the connection that the two women have. And so how they're there for one another and they push each other. And um, she's also got this, you know, ebullient energy when you're in the room. And it's not just that she's funny. It's her work ethic. It's the way that she works, which I really uh, learned a lot from. She's she's clear and asks the right questions. And I'm much messier <laughs> than she is, which I've learned is, is my way and is a good way for me. But um, she's... Uh, I come in and if you look at my script, it's just a mess. It's like falling out of the loose leaf and it's scribbled all over. And hers is like beautifully crisp. And if she has any notes, they're gorgeous. And she's, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, but that's the characters too, you know? And yeah. That's why the casting is so crazy. It's, yeah. yeah. When you do something, um, when you originate something, uh, how much pride I take in, 
having been the genesis of that and seeing it go on and on in its many incarnations and connect with so many people, young generation and then the next generation. Yeah, and I can make the case I'm, that Elphaba is a part of you. You are an She ex- is a part of me. You're a part of her. Like, yes. The character that people have grown to love and find understanding and comfort and yes. a, a, a North Star in a lot of ways. I take pride. Here's my glass half full and my new story. Um, <laughs> I take pride in the fact that even from Maureen and Rent, that these characters have grown up with people and that those kids are now parents and they have kids and my my characters and my, my projects seem to keep evolving with everyone and um, that is extremely special and I'm very proud of that. And um, so, yes, and... Getting older has its, you know, has some really wonderful things, but I'm also not um, averse to just letting people know that I find it difficult sometimes, especially if you can't all of a sudden play a certain role that you, you know, you is your role, you know, so, and it doesn't have to just be in a specific movie. It could be anything. Madison Hotel is a real place and. Um, sort of. Yeah. It, 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 There's a hotel on Madison. That was that's the not nomad. there anymore. Is it? See, okay, now you're outing my whole thing. That's like, <laughs> so at some point the nomad went away. Now did they re? Did they buy it again? <laughs> because at, when I wrote the song, it was did someone re? Let whatever. Can we just say it's a hotel that is yeah, not just, the same as it was when my husband <laughs> and I were going there for our sexy time, and it was it's it's dark and ambient and um. And yeah, and we just, we, we had a night, the bar is really beautiful at this hotel. And, um, and so I wrote a whole song about, and I liked the song MacArthur Park from Donna Summer. I liked that idea of like the sort of really ballady brooding opening, you know, um, and then it hits and then it's like, "Uh, uh, uh." I wanted to do one of those. So, um, it doesn't necessarily sound like that song, but that was my impetus. But I also feel like a night like that flows in the exact same tempo as what you just described. Yeah, and then it ends with the same piano. It almost sounds like Piano Man a little bit. Um, and it's almost like the whole thing was just a dream in a bar. It took you on a disco uh, acid trip. Now you're back <laughs> in the bar. Was it ever real? <laughs> By the way, the album's waiting for you. It's called Drama Queen. One of my favorites, too, Make Me Hate Me. Mm, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. my husband's favorite. Why does he love it? I don't know. He thinks the groove, he likes the groove the most. He thinks it's it's hot and sexy and it's got like a, it, it definitely, that's one of the songs that are a little bit more angry. There's not much anger on the album. It's mostly hopeful and joyful and celebratory. That one's a little bit more in your face. Just watch why he probably likes that. He's not afraid of my power. <laughs> <laughs> he's not afraid of my anger, but he is a therapist. So I think that he's just, Healthy. you know, yeah, he's comfortable just listening. Can he dance? Uh, he can dance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what was I saying about that? Oh, make me hate me. Yeah, and that was written with Laura Velt, who's like one of the most amazing Grammy-winning songwriters out there. Who we worked on um, another movie song we wrote together, and um, yeah, I love that song. Is love when somebody you know makes makes you hate yourself? Is that love? <laughs> No, that's not love. That's 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 toxic stuff. You know, uh, it's love for your the, the, the lyric is you can't make me hate me. You can't make me hate myself. So it's that's me rising up and saying to somebody, um, you're not going to you're not going to do this to me. You're not going to take away my light. You're not going to make me hate me. You, the, the lyric is, um, you can make me out to be a sadistic drama queen, but you can't make me hate me. You can shit talk all you please, make a villain out of me, but you can't make me hate me. So that's that's me getting up into somebody's Power. somebody's face. Yeah. Drama queen's waiting for you. Click the link in the description below. Final <laughs> thoughts? Did you have a Long Island accent at one point? Don't I have one right now? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it usually comes in a little bit. It depends what we talk about. If I had a drink, I it would definitely you would definitely hear it. Oh. But yes, I had. I I do have it, and I'm so proud that you're not hearing it right no, now. All you? those speech and diction classes at <laughs> so NYU have paid ask, off. Did you work? work well, I got towards- so ashamed and aware. I, they would I'd hear it back in class, and you know, go to do Shakespeare and sound like an idiot. <laughs> So, yes, I look, like, for instance, um, so funny, my son living out here in L.A., he does not have it. So, you know, 
things like, um, cause and when my dad comes around, um, who's from the Bronx, it's just, ooh. but, uh, we, what do we say? Like, um, uh, uh, like orange, you know, I say orange. Did I just say it? Orange, orange instead yeah. of orange or, um, I've had to learn when I do voiceover stuff, I can't say forest. I have to say the forest, <laughs> things like that. But normally, like my my dad's best friends used to be Barry and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and Barry and Mary coming over? I never even knew. It's Barry, Barry and Mary mm -hmm. like that. That's ugh, that's so boring, don't you think? My <laughs> sister is Kara, C-A-R-A. -A. I call her Kara, but everybody out here calls her Kara. It's Kara. Oh, yeah. so it's, no, I grew up in Philly, and I had a Philly accent, and I had to lose that. Right? Like, instead of bagel, I used to say bagel. Instead of water, I would say water. What? Well, what about people that put R's at the end? People that I know from the Bronx, older people, one person I know in particular calls me a deaner. <laughs> <laughs> what is the R? There's no R's in water, but then they add the R in certain things. <laughs> And I don't know where that comes from. I don't think it's a Philly thing. Linguistically, I yeah. I mean, mm. I've heard people call a washer a washer. My mother does that. <laughs> and she's from the Bronx. What? Yes, washer. Everything's with the R. That's exactly. Yeah, they had R's. Yeah. The only thing, my mom moved to Colorado when my sister went to school in um, University of Colorado Boulder. And they both started to get rid of the accent. I guess they could hear other people around. It's kind of like the Madonna syndrome you know when you're in another place and all of a sudden you start to sound like you're british or whatever so they started to sound more you know like they're from colorado or something but whenever she's talking it's like really nice or she doesn't have her new york accent and then she'll be like so is thinking kara and you and the girls and i love you and just want to come in and if you're going to be doing something in manhattan i'll i'll fly into LaGuardia, and then i'll <laughs> <laughs> like, you're giving yourself away. What is it? <laughs> yeah. I mean. Icon. East Coast. East Coast. Lives in us forever. I love LA because I like being a mom here. So, it, and I fell in love with a man that's a valley guy. Um, but I swore it off for a long time. And the only reason I think I ended up being open to loving out here was because I had my son out here. And um, it's a different it's different for you to be a New Yorker with a kid is very hard. And to be out here, you get to see the city in, in a lot more of its glory awesome. than through the eyes of the business. You know? Home isn't necessarily where you're at to you're with, right? And yes. Like, the memories you make with those people. So that's what matters more than anything. Yes, it's true. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. You're incredible. Uh, please listen to Drama Queen. It's waiting for you. All of Adina's music is sitting on Amazon Music. Just talk to Alexa, talk to your device, or tap the link or click the link in the description below. Thank you for thank putting up with so us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for putting up with me. And thanks for including us in your documentary. On Wait, this. I'm not going to say thank you for putting up with me. I'm going to say, yeah, you should be lucky to have me today. That's it. That's there it. You that's go. my new story. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> thank you. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> Adina Menzel, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>